Hi and welcome to a new video. A few weeks ago I was testing the MSI X299 Gaming Pro Carbon and actually the board was pretty solid when it comes to overclocking. Also XMP was working very well even with high memory clocks for me. So that was actually a very good board. So today we will take a look at the X299 XPower Gaming AC. The X-Power boards are usually quite solid when it comes to overclocking, no matter if it's X299 or um, Z270 for example. X-Power usually stands for high quality um, components and therefore also quite solid boards. When I was testing the Gaming Pro Carbon, we were actually using a full cover monoblock for CPU that also cools the VRM because the, the board itself was actually quite solid. It only lacked surface area on the VRM cooler. But today, testing the X Power board, you can see that this VRM block is actually connected to the block on the left here over a heat pipe. And I think if I just take a look at it, it should, like, should be like three or four times the surface area of the Gaming Pro Carbon. So that should be sufficient surface area for overclocking, even only using the EK Supremacy EVO and not using a full cover monoblock. So in today's video, I'm using the i9-7920X, which is a high core count Skylake X CPU. Of course, you can use this kind of tutorial, which we will do in this video for any Skylake X CPU. It doesn't really matter if you're using a six core, 12 core, 18 core or whatever. One aspect I want to talk about quickly is the fact that it doesn't really matter how many cores your, C your CPU has. So it doesn't really matter if it has like six core, 10 core or if it's 12 core, 18 core, you can usually clock them to the around the same level. That's mainly because the core density, the power density of the, of the CPU is more important than how many cores you really have. Um, of course, you have to keep in mind that the cooling has to be sufficient. That's the only thing that's important. So if your cooling is sufficient enough, it doesn't really matter if you're using an 18 core or 12 core, you can essentially clock both CPUs to around the same level. In today's tutorial, we're using, as I said before, the Supremacy Evo CPU cooler and in combination with an EK Waterblocks 240 radiator. Of course, 240 is not really that much. If you're using a 360, 420 or whatever, you should be able to reach better temps than me and essentially be able to clock higher. As I said before, there are actually um, Skylake X, you have two different CPUs. As you probably know, you have the low core count and the high core count. Low core count is from six to 10 cores. High core count is from 12 to 18 cores. So it doesn't really matter if you have a six core, if you have a 10 core, if you have a low core count, the CPUs, those can, those can usually clock to around the same level. Same goes for the high core count CPUs. They can also clock to about the same level. The 7920X I'm using today, the 12 core CPU is deleted already with liquid metal. Usually you can gain like 10 to 15 degrees on the high core count CPUs and on the small core count CPUs, sometimes even up to 20 degrees Celsius lower temperatures. I'm not going to do a full unboxing with you because usually that's not really interesting, but one th feature I would like to show you is the MSI M.2 Expander Z. So basically that's an expander card you can use for two M.2 drives. And the good thing about this is that it's basically using eight PCI Express lanes and they're connected to the CPU depending on which slot you use, obviously. But if you use um, the uh, slot that's connected to your CPU PCI Express lanes, you can hook the M.2 drives up to your CPU at full speed. Usually you should be able, I didn't check it, but you should be able to run those two M.2 drives in RAID. Um, so if you use this card, you should be able to reach higher speeds than using um, M.2 slots that are connected to the PCH because essentially PCH is limited to four PCI Express lanes. MSI is also bundling this high bandwidth bridge, which is always nice to have in case you're running um, two cards in SLI. So I think that's it. Um, that should be the most important features about the board, I think. No, I think I forgot the VRM. So the VRM actually is a true six phase design doubled to 12 phases. So you can see there are six doublers on the back that's doubling the, the VRM. So the VRM itself is actually quite solid and should not be an issue for overclocking, as I said before, you also have an eight pin and a four pin connector. That's also more than enough. So that should work out perfectly fine. So I'm gonna set up this uh, mainboard now with uh, the EK Supremacy Evo 240 radiator and all this kind of stuff. And then we will be back for the overclocking guide. So we are finally in the BIOS. It's actually uh, two days later for me. So let's continue on this. 
So the first uh, thing you have to do obviously is update the BIOS. So I'm on uh, version 1.40 which you can see on the top right here. And you can also see that um, actually my memory speed is only 2133 which is obvious because it's running on auto. So before you do anything else the first thing I always recommend is loading the XMP profile. So just scroll down a little bit until you see the extreme memory profile and simply load this one. So you can see I'm using a 3600 megahertz C16 on those sticks. It's a G-Skill Trident Z RGB memory and that's actually also the maximum I would recommend for Skylake X platform uh, around 3600. Everything above just costs too much money and often is not even running stable on some boards so it's usually too much hassle to get it to work and the performance benefit is not really much so if you look for high-end platform Skylake X, then usually 3600 should be the go-to memory frequency. So apply and then we go back to BIOS. So as you can see on top, memory speed is correctly applied. So let's go back to OC on the left. So what we do first is set X OC Explore Mode to Expert, which is already set on my BIOS. Extreme OC Setup, uh, leave it to Disabled unless you do real extreme overclocking. That means extreme overclocking with uh, like liquid nitrogen or dry ice, otherwise leave, leave this disabled. Now we will set the CPU Ratio Apply Mode to Per Core, which means that we can clock the cores individually and uh, set all the cores to 44. 44 means that we are essentially running the CPU at 4.5, 4.4 gigahertz. Leave CPU ratio mode on dynamic mode so the CPU can clock down in idle. That's what we want in this tutorial. So basically we are doing a base frequency of 4.4 gigahertz and whenever the CPU is not needed, when there is no performance needed, the CPU will clock down in frequency and also lower the ratio, uh, the, um, the, the voltage for power consumption. CPU ratio offset when running AVX, set this one to minus 3 and AVX 512 also to minus 3. You could even increase it for AVX 512 because this is even more stressing. AVX is basically an instruction that is very stressful for the CPU. It's running more efficient but it's also consuming a lot more power. Usually AVX is only used by specific applications. It's also used by Prime95 like the latest versions. Um, like 28.5, something like this, when it's running AVX, and also, for example, the Intel XTU benchmark. Ring ratio, I recommend to set to 24 for the start. You can always increase it later to 25, 26, 27, whatever. It will help you to gain more performance, but it also ends up very quickly in instability. So I recommend to do everything else first. And when, once you have a stable overclock of your cores and also the memory, then the last thing you should do is touch the ring ratio. So we go down to digital all power and set the CPU overcurrent protection to enhanced. This simply allows the CPU to draw a little bit more power. Now change SVID to disabled and VCC in um, is basically the voltage that is delivered from your VRMs of your, your voltage regulators from your motherboard to the CPU. So set this one to 1.85. If this one is too low, it can happen that your CPU is throttling and you don't even see it. So it actually, you lose performance, you don't even notice. So make sure you have enough VCC in voltage. Anything up to two volt is totally fine here. Change uh, CPU core ring voltage mode to offset mode. So as I said before, in this tutorial, we want the CPU to lower the voltage in idle. This option here allows you to set an even higher voltage. So basically, what we're doing now is apply this setting and go to Windows, check what our voltage is. It should be around 1.2 volt. And whenever we clock even higher, if we need more voltage for a more stable overclock, we can increase the voltage by using this offset. You can see that DRAM voltage is actually set correctly to 1.36. Personally, I still like to set this manually to make sure it's always there. And then we go to CPU features go to long duration power limit, just type anything to make sure that there is no power limit holding us back. Same for CPU current limit. Then there is one interesting other feature is the CPU over temperature protection. Usually those CPUs are throttling down at 93 or 94 degrees Celsius. 
if you're doing stability testing like in this um, guide with Prime95, it could be that you're really reaching the limits of your cooling and therefore it could help you that you increase the over temperature protection. It's really safe if you increase this to like 105 just for a stability test, like one or two hours is absolutely safe because usually if you're hitting those temperatures in Prime95, you will get nowhere uh, near in any games. So usually if you have, have like 100 degrees Celsius during the stability test, you might have like 75 or 80 degree in gaming. So that's one way to get a higher overclock and increase your temperature limit a little bit. But for this moderate overclocking we're doing today, we don't need it, but whenever you wanna do really high overclocking, you can touch this option. So that's basically it. So now we save all those settings, apply them and go back to Windows. So we are in Windows and I already opened the necessary tools. So on top right we have CPU-C and you can check that we're running 4.4 gigahertz on the CPU core speed. You can also see that we're running at core voltage of 1.2 volt, which was what I was saying before. That's the rough estimate. From this point you could use the offset in the BIOS to give like 50 millivolt more for example, which we will do in the next step. So we don't need the CPU performance now and to save some power it's clocking down to 1.2 gigahertz on all the cores. It's going up and down depending on what you do obviously and also lowering the voltage accordingly. On memory you can see we're successfully running the 3600 megahertz and also you can see the 2400 megahertz cache frequency. If you do not want your CPU to clock down for whatever reason you can go to your power saving options and setting it to high performance. Well it's a German OS but if you set it to high performance you can see that the CPU clock will always stay stable on the max clock. I will use balance for this now because it's absolutely fine to do this. To check the CPU temperature we're using core temp so let's do a quick run in Cinebench and just check where we are at um, especially talking about the performance I think we should hit like 3000 or 2900 points in Cinebench. The cool thing is it's really fast on those Skylake X high core count chips. So yeah we have 2900 points that's exactly where we should, should be at. You can also see the maximum uh, core temperature was around 60 degree Celsius. So in hardware info we also have some very interesting data. So for example you can check the CPU power consumption. Actually we can also check it below here. Exactly here. So this thing here, this part is well I would say the most interesting part. So this is about your voltage regulators. So you can see that the PSU is delivering 12 volt to your VRMs. The VRMs are delivering 1.825, like 1.85 what we said in the BIOS, to the CPU itself. And this is the MOSFET temperature which is currently at 56 degrees Celsius in idle. And you can also check the power consumption of the CPU itself. You can see that the CPU drew 248 watt during a load and that's one interesting thing I want to talk about with you guys. So let's open Prime95 quickly because often I read that Prime95 would be irrelevant and the data is not realistic. So we do the torture test and we set it to large FFTs for this one. And if we check the power consumption here now, you can see that the power, power door like 240 watt is essentially the same as what we had during Cinebench. So, well, if you want to test your CPU and stability, obviously you should use this kind of load because if you're using a CPU like that, for example, for some rendering work like I do when I render those YouTube videos, obviously I have around this CPU load. So it makes no sense to use a stability or a stress test tool that is drawing like 50 watt less power just for the sake of keeping the VRMs cold. So you can see the power draw is actually quite significant and according to my testing on this board it's fine to draw up to 290 watt constantly without a proper airflow on the board, that's fine. If you want to draw any more power, so we're talking about let's say 4.7 gigahertz and above for high core count CPUs, so 12 to 18 core above 4.7 gigahertz, you will need some proper airflow on the fans. Ideally you would use a full cover block. I'm not sure if there is a full cover block already available for the X power, but I think if you put a fan over the VRMs, it should be fine that you can draw like 320, 330 watts probably and that should be fine for 4.8, 4.9 gigahertz even, even on high core count like 18 core or uh, 16 core CPUs. So 
If you're fine with an overclock of 4.4 GHz, obviously you could leave your CPU exactly like this and test your stability with like Prime95 for at least one or two hours. But I want to increase the CPU cores actually a little bit more. So we will go back to the BIOS and do per core overclocking. So back in the BIOS, we will do the per core overclocking, go back to OC. And here is something that's called favored index. Basically, this means the board is detecting which cores inside the CPUs should be the best CPU cores in there. So obviously you can spend some time if you want to and test every single core individually. It means that you lower all CPU cores maybe to like 30 and increase every single core one by one and test which is the, the best one or you can just trust this feature. For example, we will overclock six of the 12 cores to 4.7. So we will use the six best cores according to the BIOS. So setting six of the cores to a core ratio of 47. I tested the CPU earlier and I noticed that I need a little bit more voltage for 4.7. So as I said before, there is the CPU core voltage offset and I have to set this one to 0.05. So it's like 50 millivolt more voltage on the CPU. It really depends on your CPU. It could be that it's not even necessary on yours. You just have to test this or follow this tutorial and try from this baseline on. So apply those settings and go back to Windows. So back in Windows, checking on CPU Z, you can see that some of the cores, actually six of the cores are running at 4.7 gigahertz and the rest are running on 4.4 gigahertz. So Especially for gaming, it would make sense that you use a tool, for example, Process Lasso. I will put a link in the descri uh, description about this tool. You can uh, link CPU cores, well, specific CPU cores to specific applications. So, for example, if you're running, I don't know, Players Unknown Battlegrounds, you can link the seven, uh, the six cores that are running 4.7 gigahertz. You can assign those cores to the game and unsign the other cores just to make sure that the game is actually using the high clocked cores. So let's quickly do a Cinebench run, especially check performance, also check what the power consumption is during the Cinebench run. And you can see this, the power consumption is actually not even low. So you can see I'm, use, I'm having around 280 watt power consumption. And we're remember, we're not even running all cores on 4.7. So if you're planning to run all cores of 4.7 or above, uh, especially for render applications, um, I would recommend that you have very, very good airflow on the VRMs. The score increased from around 2,900 to 3,000 points, which is really solid for a 12-core CPU. Really cannot complain about that. So if you want to test your CPU for stability, I would recommend that you would do another run of Prime95. And you can see that the power consumption is actually, well, not even low. So you can see it's still like 270 watt, even using high FFTs. As I said before, this is really realistic, especially considering what a load of Cinebench is, especially if you're doing render applications. This is not unrealistic. Now the problem is if you're running torture tests and if you select custom FFTs and do like smaller FFT sizes like 12, it results in a really insane power consumption, which you can see here. So it's like 315 now, 320 watt probably. And this would be too much. The board on a longer period would not be able to handle this kind of load um, VRM temperature wise. So I just waited two more minutes and you can see that the VRM temperature is already hitting 96 degrees Celsius. That's what, what I was talking about. So of course this load is higher, even higher than rendering. You can see it's getting closer to 100 degrees Celsius. Essentially if it's hitting 105 degrees Celsius, it will throttle down the CPU as what we had before. Obviously if you have, um, some kind of fan above your VRM, for example, a radiator of your AIO or whatever, it will prevent your CPU from throttle down because the, the heatsink is actually quite big and big enough to handle this kind of load if your airflow is good enough or especially if you're using a full cover monoblock. Overall, the board is quite good, so I didn't have any kind of memory issues. All the features in BIOS are working quite well. Overclocking, especially per core overclocking, is working very nicely. So I can recommend the board. If you really plan to do massive overclocks with an 18 core above 4.5 gigahertz, you should have really good airflow and you should also use a monoblock or something similar. Um, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the video. Actually, I hope the video was not too long. I'm not even sure I have to check while cutting the video. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care. See you soon.